Hi, so today I'd like to talk a little bit about this whole FBI and the iPhone thing with the whole trying to hack into the iPhone, the FBI having issues hacking into the iPhone, they spent a bunch of money to hack into the iPhone, and then this researcher at a university winds up doing the same thing the FBI did, pretty much, you know, it looks like, you know, just bubble guns and duct tape by comparison to the FBI's resources. He was able to get in and he provided a really, really great document showing every single thing that he did. I would highly suggest that you find this and read it. And I'm going to mispronounce his name, so I'm just going to highlight it. But he, he did step by step. He did pictures. He cited sources. This is just an amazingly well-written piece. And I suggest that you read it. Now, a lot of people have been criticizing the FBI. The FBI spent upwards of a million dollars trying to get information out of this phone. And this guy, again, with, with what is, by com in contrast to the FBI, uh, bubble gum and, and duct tape was, was able to do the same thing. And he detailed how he did it. Now, I, a lot of people are criticizing the FBI saying, see, he was able to do it like that. Why couldn't you? And I understand the criticism to some extent. Because the FBI is one of the largest law enforcement agencies in, in the United States, whereas this is one guy looking up stuff on the internet, like a, again, a researcher at a university. You would expect that the FBI would be able to figure this stuff out, and they didn't. And a lot of people have been, you know, throwing a little bit of snark at the FBI over that, and that I understand, that I'm not going to dispute. What I am going to dispute is this article that came out, which again, did I, did I already tell you how much I just can't stand tech journalists and my bias against tech journalists for the fact that they very often do not practice any, any real journalism while, while doing their work. There's this article that came out, and it's, in, it's entitled, $100 store-bought kit can help anyone, I repeat, anyone hack into the iPhone passcodes. Store-bought kit can help anybody hack into the iPhone passcodes. And, there, and she, you know, she, she quoted Sergey here, and she's talking about the FBI a little bit and how they paid $1.3 million for a third party to hack into it. And she's saying that this guy was able to do what the FBI said they couldn't do. It's a very, very short article, again, with this title, Store-Bought Kit Can Help Anyone Hack Into iPhone Passcodes. And the issue that I have with, the, with, with this is like store-bought kit and anyone is that, again, it makes it very, very obvious that the tech journalist did absolutely no work here. So in, a, you know, in an older video, I was talking about a CNET, a CNET writer, Sarah Pierwal, that did this article on how, you know, oh yeah, you can just replace your iPhone 6 glass only with a suction cup and a plastic pry tool. Even if you are really, really advanced and good at this, it is going to come out like absolute garbage if you use just those tools and nothing else. Uh, and the average person, 99 out of 100 of them are just going to destroy their phone doing that. But oh, that, that's not going to make for an interesting article. And the same thing is true here. We have this article saying a $100 store-bought kit can help anyone, and I mean anyone, that's what it says, hack into iPhone passcodes. And if you go over this, I mean, let's just think about this here, anyone. Does anyone have a PhD in computer science? Does anyone have a master's degree in science, physics, and electronics dating back over 10 years ago? Does anyone have experience hacking hardware security for 20 years? Can anyone solder, desolder the NAND flash chip from the iPhone without destroying it? Then have anyone solder individual wires from that NAND chip onto a PC board? Then have anyone write a program in C or use some like, uh, to make this work, I mean, let's just read through this, because this is something, I want to read through it, because it's very, very obvious that the person who wrote this fucking article didn't read anything, so I figured that we should at least read it so that we're ahead of the Guardian. So, let's just go through this a little bit. So, let's see, first let's just look for the word program here. So, he figured out how to program it, he has this self-made universal IC programmer. Yeah, this, oh yeah, by the way, store-bought. Yeah, yeah, I know. They, 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 you find this in CVS, right, next to the tampons, the diapers, and the vitamin B, right? Like, what the, the fuck? Store bought. Like, you're, because that, that, that title implies anyone who can just go to a store and buy this. Like, well, and if you go to the article, you'll see. Like, let's search for the word store. What, what, what store is this in? Store bought kit. Because see, kit, here's the, here's the problem with the word kit. Kit implies pre-assembled, like, or even if it's not pre-assembled, that it has everything you need inside the kit like an iFixit guide, like uh, one of those Arduino setups where they send you everything you need with the sensors, with the instructions, with the how-to. Where is this? 
Show me the Radio Shack where they have this set up as a kid. Show me the CVS where this is set up as a kid. Show me the Best Buy where anyone can buy this and do it. Like, again, no, just get out of here with that shit. But if we go to read the article, all the signals were replicated with a slower communication speed of one megahertz using the C programming language. So this guy used a logic analyzer to work out a proprietary custom protocol used for NAND communication, and then used the C program language to replicate that communication at a one megahertz speed. Anyone, store-bought kit, are, are you fucking kidding me? Like if we continue reading this article and we continue going through to realize the issues that he was having, some of the issues he was having, uh, th these are issues that you would expect on a breadboard, by the way. You see how he's wiring the chip? So over here he's wiring the NAND flash to the, you know, to, to the board after you know, cloning it, this thing. By the way, I have worked with students. I've taught many people. I've taught people that have electronics experience, and I've taught people that have zero electronics experience. Uh, and, and, I, and I know that in, within this entire range, it is very possible, if you have a class of 12 students, to have one or two or three students that at the end of the class still have difficulty soldering a large LCD connector. And again, when you use the word anyone, yeah, because anyone is just going to solder 20 or 40 or 60 wires from the motherboard to the flash without screwing anything up. And anyone, by the way, anyone is going to find out that there's oscillation and ringing on the line using their oscilloscope, which they're totally well versed in using, to realize that there was oscillation and ringing that wasn't present. And then anyone is going to know that obviously, because it comes in the guide when you buy this kit at CVS, that you're going to put termination resistors in series with each one of those lines to get rid of the oscillation and ringing at the expense of about one or two nanoseconds of delay. I mean, I would honestly say this is even worse than Sarah Purewell's article on how you can fix an iPhone 6, glass only, with a $25 kit, a suction cup, a pry tool. Man, no, no heat gun, no, no hot plate, no loco, ochre, or any of that. Just, this, is even, this is even worse than that article. This actually trumps that one. Like, if you just read through this whole thing, and again, I would suggest that all of you read through it rather than just looking at my highlights, you will see that this... This is some advanced level shit, and, and he does a great job of bringing this, this chair really does squeak a lot, don't buy the Aeron chair knockoffs, anyway. He does a really good job of making this seem simple, and that's, that, that's one of the signs of, of, a, of a true genius, because everybody says, you know, the geniuses are the ones that write this stuff that, oh my god, I would never understand this, but the true geniuses are the people like Sergey here, who know that if they can explain this very, very advanced topic in a way that almost anybody can read through it, digest it, and understand it. I think anybody who works in our industry would, would admit, as long as they don't have the ridiculously large ego, that this is a difficult thing to do. This is something that requires hours and hours, days, weeks, maybe months of trial and error to get done to find a solution. That you're going to be staying up all night for a long time. You're going to be asking a lot of questions that nobody has an answer to. And you're going to be trying over and over again to make something work. And, you know, one of the pet peeves I have with this is that a lot of people will say, that, you know, what I do is easy or I make it look easy, this, that, and the other. And yeah, I do make it look easy, but in order to figure out that quarter fan spin was being caused by a clock IC, yeah, it's easy now. It's easy after you figure it out. Everything is easy once you figure it out, and everything is difficult before you figured it out. Some people will say that the sysclock RTC signal will go over 1.7 volts when the clock chip is dead, and sometimes it does, but sometimes it doesn't, and sysclock RTC is perfectly present but that chip being damaged will cause quarter fan spin. And again, it's one of those things where I figured it out, so obviously, of course, the fan spinning like this is gonna be related to the clock because it's, it's related to time, and the amount of time the fan spun is about one thirty-second thousandth of a second. Uh, everything makes sense after you do it, but before you figure it out, it's impossible, and you're pulling your hair out, and you're screaming, and you feel like an idiot, and every single one of us that's figured out anything spent time feeling like an idiot before we got to the point where we were successful. And yes, yes, I will, I will accept the snark on the FBI. The FBI should be able to figure out the same stuff that a security researcher at a, at a college could figure out. I do agree with that. But at the same time, I think people are really oversimplifying this and making it seem like the, you know, the FBI are just a bunch of dunces that, that have absolutely no idea what they're doing, that, you know, that, that, that barely even know how to check their AOL email because they couldn't do what the security researcher did with $100 of stuff. And again, they don't include what the security researcher is using. His PhD in computer science from 11 years ago, 
his master's degree in science and physics, automatics, uh, automatics and electronics from 1997. He has a background in chemistry, electronics, computer science, physics. He worked in an, uh, for, he was, uh, I need to get breakfast. I was working for industry designing various electronic devices for eyesight diagnostic and correction. Again, when you use the word anyone, this literally spits in the face of everybody that actually spent time sitting in a room, torturing themselves for 12 to 16 hours a day, not getting any sleep until 3 or 4 in the morning until they figured it out. And this is something that I talk about with Jessa, because Jessa, she does that now. She, she sits in a room until 3 or 4 in the morning for weeks on end, gets no sleep, has worse bags under her eyes than I do, neglects everything else in her life to figure out some long screw damage on an iPhone 6 and now it causes no backlight, just so that she could be the one that figured it out. And once she figures it out, oh, yeah, it's easy. Oh, it's obvious. Didn't you all know that? But before she figures it out, before she figured it out, nobody on any forum had any clue what they were doing. Nobody figured it out. It's easy to say it's easy once somebody has figured it out for you, but it's hard to be the person that actually sits in the room for 12 to 16 hours a day at the expense of everything else in their life to figure it out. And the difference between the idiot and the genius is not their level of experience. It's not always how intelligent they are, how much experience they have, how much effort they put in. The idiot is the one that didn't figure it out, and the genius is the one that did. Very often, the difference between genius and idiot, success and failure is, oh, I, I figured it out. And I hate to use the word luck. I did talk about how you shouldn't use the word luck in your own, uh, you know, to just define what you can and cannot do with your own life. And now a lot of people, I feel, use luck as an excuse to define what wealthy people or hardworking people have done. But, you know, I was talking with Jessa, and because she, what she did in, you know, her past life and her past job is she, were, she was a researcher working to try and cure cancer. And what she said is that you will have to test many, many different theories. And there could be an intern that started, you know, and that's two months in, and they find the cure to something just because they checked the right thing and they chose by random, whereas you could be working in the field for 40 years and never get anywhere. And it can be really depressing to know that you're doing a good job, to know that you, that you know your stuff and that you're putting time and effort in and not figure anything out. It is, and I feel that these type of comments, these types of articles, these types of titles really shit on the people at the FBI that probably did what I do or what Jessa does or what the security researcher does, which is stay up at night, you know, again, n neglect everything else in our lives so that we could figure out this one fucking thing. You know, Duke on the forum that I, that I have, on the motherboard repair forum, just recently, I'm not going to say how, he figured out how you can use a $30 graphics chip that's just as good as the $230 graphics chip in the, new, in, uh, the 2011 iMac that has all the, all, the, all the failures. He spent about 12 hours of his day, a good 12 hours of his day, just sitting there saying, this shows up a black screen. How do I modify this machine via hardware, software, or firmware so that I can use this $30 chip that's gonna be better than the $230 chip that's being sold. Because the $230 chip is rare, it's hard to find, that's why it's expensive, it's not because it's better. He spent 12 hours of his life doing that. And that, that, you know, that, that, that is what we do. That is what all of us do to figure this stuff out and you're really kind of spitting in the face of all the people who do that when you say, oh, a store-bought kit, anyone. Particularly when that's not even the fucking truth. Again, like just, Show me the CVS that this shows up in. Of course you can't cite where you found it. Of course you cannot cite wh what store you buy the kit from. Of course you're gonna call it a kit rather than a collection uh, of pieces that somebody came up with after months and months of researching using 20 years of experience. Because that makes for a better news article that gets you more clicks, that gets you more views, that gets you more affiliate revenue. But this is not journalism, this is bullshit. And there's either one of two possibilities, either she, either Olivia never read the article at all and just, she never read the article and is just an ignorant tech journalist, or she actually read this article. She read this entire thing, including all citations, including everything required, including all programming knowledge, including all electronics knowledge, all soldering, all you know, reverse engineering by eavesdropping on communication protocols and commands and decided to outright lie to every single person who clicked that article by allowing them to believe that anyone can do this. To every single one of the tech journalists that think that they can just copy and paste shit from everywhere else to not actually put any real journalistic effort into providing a real story, real information with, with, with proper context, just just stop, just stop, just find a new job and stop 
to stop polluting the internet with more garbage misinformation. It's, it just doesn't do anybody good, and we should just stop clicking this shit. And the irony is that by doing this video, I'm going to cause more people to click on this article, more people to read it, more affiliate revenue, more comments, which means that The Guardian is going to think that this article, the person who wrote this article, should write more articles. So, I mean, I'm, I'm part of the problem here as well, which just makes me even more sick. But anyway, that's it for today. As always... I hope you learned something. Really do read this article, seriously. It's, um, yeah, just, just, I'm, I'm, just, I'm probably going to forget to put this in the description, so I'm just going to put it up here one more time so you can read the URL that I have here. It's, the title of it is The Bumpy Road of iPhone 5C Mirroring. This guy did a really just phenomenal job. Like this, th these are the types of researchers, these are the types of scientists that just, they just get stuff done, and they don't try to make it seem like it's some impossible thing or like they're holier than thou. He just, he explains, he explains all this stuff in a really simplified process and just did, just did a really good job. And like he, cited his, he cited every single one of his sources professionally. I mean, this is just a really, like, above and beyond, just amazing, amazing feat. And I think that, you know, he, he deserves some thumbs up for it. So, yeah, that's it. Time for breakfast. I'm hungry.